Yeah? All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming here and joining us uh, to, to this event here. So uh, this is actually going to be an event hosted by the International Space University, Southern Hemisphere Space Studies Program. Uh, just for background, uh, the program actually is a five-week intensive uh, program uh, that's actually very interdisciplinary, international, intercultural, and uh, we teach everything that has to do with space, uh, all aspects, all disciplinaries of space. And we're very happy to have this year uh, about 46 participants from 11 different countries. And it's a partnership between um, ISU and uh, UniSA, actually. So it's, um, and actually, this year is going to be the eighth time we run the program. So it's a very successful uh, partnership we have developed in the previous years. And uh, we continue that legacy moving forward. So before we begin, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Ghana people, who are the traditional custodians of this land. Uh, we pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal people uh, present here. Uh, so today's lecture is actually going to be the concluding uh, uh, distinguished lecture event for the ISU and the Southern Hemisphere Space Studies program. And uh, we have two more weeks before the program conclusion. So we're actually very pleased to have uh, with us today a very distinguished uh, guest. He's actually my former boss and, and friend, uh, Brigadier General uh, Dr. Uh, Pete Warden. Uh, Dr. Warden actually has a PhD in astronomy from uh, Arizona, University of Arizona, uh, um, and actually was a very successful researcher. He had about 150 research papers in his tenure, so it's, uh, he's very well known in the specific field uh, of expertise. Uh, uh, one of his previous assignments before being for decades in the Air Force as Brigadier General, he was the center director for NASA Ames Research Center. And he's been credited with actually uh, with a lot of amazing projects uh, with the quantum computer, for example, the, the CubeSat. And I believe uh, some of the initiatives that substantially transformed the center at the NASA M Center to become one of the most uh, relevant uh, centers in uh, the agency. In 2015, he decided uh, to retire after a long uh, distinguished uh, career at NASA. I think he was the, the highest serving center director, almost. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and then he, he went to become the, the, the chairman, actually, of the Breakthrough Initiative. But while actually his uh, tenure at, at Ames, uh, he was actually, he received the Outstanding Leadership Medal. And also he received the Federal Lab Consortium Lab Director of the Year, which are very, very uh, prestigious uh, awards actually given to a very limited number of people. And uh, just to finish up the, the introduction, actually, he recently uh, received, he was knighted by the government of Luxembourg. So, and so would like to welcome Sir, uh, Pete Ward into the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Omar. I'm, I'm really honored to be here, uh, particularly when I look at the temperatures in the United States, uh, although it's a little warm here today. Uh, but uh, uh, in California, it's 15 degrees and raining. The rain is good. And, and I'm from Detroit originally, and I looked at, and it was minus 23 last night there, so uh, anybody complains about the heat, it's just consider the other side of the planet. Uh, I, I'm also really uh, pleased to be in, in, uh, in uh, Adelaide because, uh, you know, where I live in California is known, known for wine, uh, and as, as noted, I live part-time in Luxembourg, and uh, they're also noted for wine. There's, there's a country to the south of Luxembourg that may be noted too. Uh, and, and I have to say that, that the, the wine in South Australia is much better than that European country, uh, <laughs> but not quite as good as California. So, so I invite you all to come and visit. Uh, at, at any rate, what I'd, uh, what I'd like to do is talk to you today about, uh, uh, let's see if I get to the right directions here, uh, some of our programs, uh, and uh, uh, in particular, uh, that our primary target which is the star system Alpha Centauri, uh, which uh, you have the honor in the Southern Hemisphere of actually being able to see. Uh, I guess it's the second brightest star in the sky if I haven't gotten my astronomy wrong uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, but what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about my foundation uh, that, uh, that I've been working for almost four years. Uh, the, uh, th this foundation started in about 2012 uh, with, the, with the development of, of the Breakthrough Prizes. Uh, and the Breakthrough Prizes were started by a, uh, a physicist uh, and, uh, and billionaire, Yuri Milner. Uh, he was dismayed to find, when he looked at lists of who the most admired people on the planet are, 
that there were few, if any, scientists. And so being a billionaire, uh, he decided that, that maybe we could fix that with money. <laughs> so, uh, so he got together with a couple other billionaires that you probably have heard of, Mark Zuckerberg, Sergey Brin, Jack Ma, uh, and Wierzewski. And uh, they set up the breakthrough prizes. And uh, the, the prizes are, uh, are the largest prizes in science. They're three million US dollars, almost three times the size of some Swedish prize I'm not supposed to mention. And uh, it's a little older than ours, but... Uh, uh, and uh, there's, uh, there's uh, the, the first prize was the fundamental physics. There are now four prizes in life sciences and then one in mathematics. Uh, plus some early career prizes in physics and mathematics and some other prizes I'm going to talk about. But uh, why this was relevant is uh, uh, there was about six years ago when I was the director of NASA Ames, my chief of staff came in and said, uh, uh, you'll never guess who's here to see you. And I said, no, I probably won't, please tell. <laughs> and it was, uh, she said it was Vanity Fair. And I said, oh, well. Am I the best dressed center director? And she says, no, you're pretty near the bottom. And uh, the, uh, the, some of the rest of them were astronauts and they were better dressed than I was. Uh, but uh, uh, it turns out that Vanity Fair does the kind of neatest party in Hollywood. It's the post-Oscar party. I've never been there, but the billionaires I work for have. Uh, but uh, when Yuri and his colleagues started the prize, they asked Vanity Fair to set up a prize ceremony for uh, for the breakthrough prizes. And uh, uh, so they wanted to do it in Silicon Valley and uh, they uh, looked around and thought the coolest place in Silicon Valley, which I agreed with, was NASA Ames. Uh, there's a bunch of old 1930s airship hangars there. And uh, so we did the prize ceremony and, and these are pretty cool. This is this year, so we had 007 as our MC. Uh, he looks a little, a little older than he, than he did when he was in 007. But it's a pretty glitzy uh, prize. We, uh, it's the uh, only time you'll ever see physicists in uh, uh, black tie and, uh, and other scientists. But uh, uh, it, it's held at the, at the, at the uh, NASA Ames Research Center. And uh, I was the landlord, so I got invited. Uh, but just to tell you why I think it's such a cool prize, uh, this is Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Uh, she was the discoverer of the pulsar. And uh, that Swedish committee ignored her, instead gave her advisors the prize. Uh, so we thought maybe we could addre address that uh, slight and also honor her for her lifetime of, of incredible accomplishments. Uh, and I also say she's such a neat person. She took the $3 million of prize money and has uh, donated it to, uh, to setting up scholarships and, and fellowships for underserved groups, uh, particularly women and other groups that don't have access to scholarships. So at any rate, I'm very proud to be involved in this prize. Uh, we do have another prize, and I want to, you know, before I get into talking about interstellar stuff, uh, talk about this prize. Uh, we started about four years ago a Breakthrough Junior Challenge, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, is, I think, really neat. Also, I'm the, I chair the selection committee. Uh, but uh, we ask for high school students between the ages of 13 and 18 to do about a three-minute video and uh, on some uh, basic idea in science. Uh, we had almost 10,000 entries the last uh, year or so. And uh, uh, the, uh, this is, uh, is co-sponsored by the, the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, uh, Cold Spring Laboratory, and, and National Geographic. Uh, the winner gets a 250,000 U.S. dollar scholarship to go wherever they want to in the world. Uh, the school gets a, uh, uh, a new laboratory put together by Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, and uh, what I think is kind of coolest, the, the teacher gets a $50,000 check that, that inspired the student. And I think it's really important to, to honor the teachers. Uh, we've, we've given out uh, five of these. Uh, the, uh, these are for young people from all over the world, a uh, uh, mixture of young men, young women. Uh, and I'm really proud of uh, that the, 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 the talent is everywhere. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, actually, you know, if you, if you live in Silicon Valley, you're really interested in startups. And, they, and, and one of the things I learned a long time ago is that startups, you need to have the most diverse possible 
group. Uh, in fact, I'm fond of saying if everybody looks like you in your startup, you've goofed up. So uh, this, by the way, is a dream team for startups so, uh, from, from all over the world, so uh, it's a pretty cool thing. Well, let me turn now to the, to the breakthrough initiatives. Uh, and uh, uh, when I left NASA four years ago, uh, I was, uh, was, was enticed, didn't take much persuasion actually, uh, to leave NASA to run the initiatives because this has always been my dream. The initiatives are about the search for life in the universe. It's, a, I think, one of mankind's fundamental questions. Uh, we are now funded at several hundred million U.S. dollars with, uh, with probably a lot more to come in the future uh, to, to spend on, on things that, that are really cool science, and I'll tell you about those in a minute. Maybe the ultimate one is dealing with the Alpha Centauri system. Uh, the, uh, these are the, the key questions, I think, that, uh, that, uh, that have always inspired me and I think inspire a lot of you and inspire a lot of the public. Uh, the first one is, is there life, any life, elsewhere in the universe? And uh, uh, the, uh, as far as we know, there isn't. Uh, but uh, you know, this is a, a really cool question. The second one is, uh, uh, is there intelligent life elsewhere? Now, I, I have to make the standard joke that says, well, there's not much evidence of intelligent life here either, uh, especially if you are in the United States and listen to our national government. But it's probably not the only national government that raises in question that, that issue, but we'll leave that there since this is being recorded. Uh, but uh, the, the, the third question is the one that I, I, I've always found the most exciting. You know, uh, w when I went to high school, uh, I always was in trouble because I had my textbook with a science fiction book stuck in the, you know, and I didn't fool anybody. Uh, my mother finally told the teacher that just let him read it. If he doesn't read it, he's going to be bothering the students around him. Uh, but, uh, but the question of can we travel between the stars and... Uh, uh, you know, I always thought our solar system is kind of boring. You know, there's no interesting aliens or anything that we know of. You know, maybe there's some microbes. Uh, but uh, we, there's always hope there's something really cool in the other stellar system. So I'm going to talk quite a little bit about that topic. Uh, the, uh, uh, so to, to start this initiative, uh, in uh, uh, July 20th, 2015, uh, my principal sponsor, Yuri Milner, uh, who you see at the stage there, uh, announced a, a hundred million U.S. dollar ten-year program uh, to to look for intelligent life, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Our scientific advisor, you see on the stage there as well, is Stephen Hawking. Uh, until his death uh, last year, he was uh, very actively involved in, in our programs. Uh, and uh, these have really been his long-standing dreams as well. The, uh, uh, the first program is the $100 million program is Breakthrough Listen, uh, and it, uh, it, it's following on a, a relatively new scientific effort. Uh, in the late 1950s, uh, uh, there were a number of, of, uh, of scientists that said, you know, we now have the technology with high-powered radio that we could we could get a radio wave that would, would transmit uh, halfway across the galaxy and could be picked up by the technology we then had. So uh, uh, there were some efforts begun to, to look at using radio telescopes to look for uh, intelligent signals. Uh, well, the key guy uh, who's our senior advisor on this program is uh, now is Frank Drake. Uh, he was uh, later became the director of the Arecibo Observatory, but started looking for signals, and, and he's in his late 80s, and I asked him, well, did you ever find anything? And he said, well, actually, the first time we turned the telescope on, we looked at the nearby solar system, uh, Tau Ceti, and got a signal right away. And so we were dancing around with champagne and so on and, and, until we did a few checks and figured out it was some nearby interference source, and that's been kind of the story for that. But uh, we, we sort of found out that you know, we really haven't looked very hard. You know, I've, I, you know, when I was in graduate school, we said, okay, we've looked, there's no intelligent signals. 
Part of the problem is, is that we didn't sp haven't spent a very systematic uh, set of time. Uh, so we now have a lot of time. Uh, this is the, the world's largest steered radio telescope. This is the 100 meter uh, radio telescope at, uh, at Green Bank at West, uh, West Virginia, USA. Uh, we have 20% of the time on, that, on this, but actually the first telescope we signed up for is this one. This is the Parkes Radio Telescope, not too far from here. It's a, uh, I think it's 64 meters, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and this is a really cool telescope. If, if, you're, if you're visiting Australia, go see it. If you're an Australian, you certainly should have seen it. Uh, there's a really wonderful movie that uh, if you haven't seen, you ought to, called The Dish. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's the, this, was, this was the radio telescope that actually received the Apollo moonwalk uh, data, so it's, a, uh, it's pretty famous, and it actually really looks like a radio telescope. Uh, and, and yes, I guess they really did pay, play cricket in the, in, in the, in the dish. Uh, but uh, we uh, also are looking at, for optical signals, uh, increasingly uh, we're using lasers, and I'll talk a lot more about lasers in a bit, uh, to, uh, to communicate, and so we've started to do what's called optical SETI, uh, this is the Lick Observatory overlooking uh, uh, San Francisco Bay. Uh, the, uh, we are using it to look for, for laser signals. And uh, by the way, we're not using that big telescope on, on your right. That's the 120 inch. Uh, the, the little white dome in the middle, which is almost as big, it's a two and a half meter telescope is what we're using. Uh, and we're looking for laser signals around of coming from some of the nearest stars. Uh, we've looked, I think, about 500 of them. Is that right, Jamie? Jamie's our program manager and our chief of staff, so if, if I get the things wrong, he'll, he'll correct me, right? Yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, this is the world's largest radio telescope. This is the 500-meter radio telescope in China. Uh, we signed an agreement with, uh, with the Chinese uh, uh, National Astronomy Observatory, and uh, uh, we will be... Uh, working with the Chinese closely to use this instrument. Uh, they've committed something like 10 or 15% of the time on this uh, to look for, for extraterrestrial signals. Now, I, I might add, this is a very important instrument because it's the first radio telescope that, that has the ability to get a non-directional television signal from the nearest uh, star systems. You know, I, I was, when you talk about SETI, people say, well, we've been broadcasting I Love Lucy into the, into the cosmos for, you know, 60 years now. Surely the aliens could have picked that up. Uh, but it turns out if the nearest star system, the Alpha Centauri system, they were broadcasting I Love Gork, this is the first telescope that could actually pick it up. So we'll be listening in to see what they have to say. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is the, the oldest large radio telescope, the Jodrell Bank, I think it's 74 meters. Uh, we have a, a program with the UK to, to work with this. Uh, and this is the, the newest radio telescope on the planet, even newer than the Chinese. This is the, uh, the first installment of the square kilometer array, which will ultimately have a, a kilometer square collecting power. It's in uh, South Africa. Uh, there is a uh, lower frequency uh, equivalent uh, program here in Australia, the Murchison Widefield Array. Uh, these array telescopes are unique in the fact they can look at, at dozens of stars simultaneously. So we're going to be using this telescope and maybe one in the northern hemisphere to, uh, to survey the nearest million stars to see if there's a signal. That gets us out to about a thousand light years, which is an is a interesting uh, area where we could potentially look for signals. Uh, but I think the main thing you probably came to hear about is, is uh, Breakthrough Starshot. Uh, this is the question that says that whether or not there's, there's intelligence in nearby stars, there may very well be life, and uh, can we go survey these things close up? Uh, and uh, this has been, like I said, a long-standing dream of mine. Uh, the, uh, uh, we had an uh, advisory committee that, uh, that included winners of the Breakthrough Prize and even some of that Swedish prize uh, that looked at this for about a year and concluded there is a, a way that, we, that in your lifetimes, maybe even in mine, uh, that, uh, 
depends on how much I drink tonight, uh, that we'll be able to, to send a probe to the nearest star. Uh, we were convinced of this, so on the, uh, uh, the 12th of April 2016 at the New World Trade Center in, in New York, uh, we made an announcement again with Yuri Milner and Stephen Hawking. Uh, also there was Freeman Dyson, who is uh, sort of one of the grand old men of talking about you know, interstellar travel. Uh, Anne Druyan, who's the, the widow of Carl Sagan and the creator of the Cosmos series. Uh, Professor Avi Loeb, who's the chairman of the astronomy department at Harvard and who's actually probably one of the leading researchers in thinking about interstellar and alien stuff and so on. Uh, he's gotten a little bit of trouble lately on that, but uh, we can talk about that later. Uh, Mae Jemison, who's uh, a, a former U.S. astronaut who is uh, 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 has worked on doing privately funded efforts to do interstellar travel, uh, one called the 100-Year Starship Program, and then there's some geeky guy there that got put on the stage for comic relief. Uh, now, the, uh, the question is, is there any place to go? And uh, w when I went to graduate school uh, in like the 15th century, uh, you know, we were sort of taught that, the, that maybe one in a thousand stars, maybe one in 10,000 has a planetary system, uh, and maybe one in a million is an Earth-sized planet. Well, it turns out that like everything that we were told that's wrong, uh, this is the Kepler mission. And I had the very great honor when I was the director at NASA Ames to have this as is, is, is one of my flagship missions. Uh, the Kepler mission looked at uh, about 150,000 stars like the sun, and, and every half hour measured the brightness of a star very precisely. Uh, and the idea was that uh, you couldn't see planets directly, but if a planet passed in front of the star, it caused a small decrease in light, about 30 parts per million if it was a planet like the Earth. Uh, and uh, our, the surprising result of this was that we found that essentially every star system in the galaxy has a planetary system. And maybe a quarter of those like the sun have a planet like the Earth, that's at least the size of the Earth, orbiting in what's called the habitable zone, which is where liquid water could exist on the surface. So the likelihood of finding places like the Earth that could be life-bearing is really high. The, uh, uh, more recently, uh, uh, another instrument, the, the, the WISE uh, Observatory, Infrared Observatory in Space, looked at uh, a nearby non-solar type star. Uh, about 70% of the stars in the galaxy are these little small, well, little small, they're about 10 to 100 times the size of Jupiter, uh, uh, red dwarf stars. And, uh, uh, they found one nearby that had not one Earth, but it had seven Earth-sized planets orbiting them. Uh, three of them are in the habitable zone. So the places that we're likely to find Earths are really high. Uh, what was kind of neat about this, they called the star system TRAPPIST-1, and I'm told that's because they were drinking TRAPPIST beer. Uh, so uh, even astronomers uh, uh, can be cool. Uh, but uh, this really increases the likelihood of finding places where life could exist. Uh, can we go there? Now this is Voyager. For those of you that are geeky science fiction fans, like I am, it's V'ger. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's the fastest thing that we launched. It's the furthest from the sun that we still communicate with. Uh, it's about 130 times further away from the, from, uh, the sun than we are. Uh, and it's going really fast. But if you calculate, supposing we aim that to Alpha Centauri, which is 300,000 times further away than the sun is, uh, we'd get there in about 80,000 years. So probably not going to get federal funding for this, or even private funding. Uh, so we looked at uh, uh, what do we need to do to go to the nearest star? Well, we need to go like really fast. Uh, the, uh, uh, we need to be able to fly by the system, the, a planet if, we, if they're assuming we find one there, uh, and send the data back to the Earth. And we'd like to do this uh, uh, in a reasonable amount of time, so we'd like to, if we launch this thing, have the probe get there in about 20 years, which you can do the sums and figure out that that's 20% speed of light. Uh, 
and we'd like to do this at an affordable cost. So this is, was the challenge. Uh, and again, if you figure out what you need to do, you need to go a thousand times faster. We can do that, we can do today. Uh, now that sounds pretty hard, except that if you remember in the middle of the 20th century, we did that. We went from, you know, you know, 100, you know, kilometers an hour to, you know, 100 kilometers a second. So uh, this is doable. Uh, the, the idea is, can we do it in the next few decades? Uh, so we put together, as I said, a, a group of really brilliant people uh, the, uh, and had them look at, at, uh, at how we might do this. Uh, they looked at all these ideas. If you're, if you're a science fiction freak like I am, you know a lot of them. Most of them are rubbish. Uh, and uh, uh, let me, <laughs> that was the answer. <laughs> uh, and and, and I, I'll put an equation up here because I, I can't resist. I am a physicist. Uh, this is the rocket equation. It's the only equation I'm going to put up here. Just to show you how hard it is, uh, this is a, really a 19th century equation. I think it was, it was a Russian scientist that developed it. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, it, it, it tells you how much fuel you need, depending on how efficient the fuel is, to go a certain velocity. So you can put in... Uh, the numbers and say, I'd like to go 20% the speed of light, and I'd like to send something, you know, interstellar distances. Uh, and you find out that you need a fuel that has a, there's a, there's a, a, a number called the, uh, the specific impulse. Uh, you need something that has a, a specific impulse of about a million. Now, rocket fuel today has a specific impulse of about three or 400. So again, we're a factor of a thousand or so off from this. Uh, so this is hard. The, uh, uh, and as I said, we, uh, just to give you an idea, if we wanted to use rocket fuel, uh, we could do it, but the mass of fuel we need is about the mass of the galaxy. Uh, so that's probably gonna be passed by. Uh, nuclear energy begins to get you close. Uh, a fission rocket, which we don't know how to build, uh, has a specific impulse of about 100,000. A fusion rocket, which we even more don't know how to build, uh, has a, a, a specific impulse of a half million. Uh, antimatter, which everybody knows if you watch Star Trek is what they use, actually has a, a specific impulse of eight million. So our first idea was why don't we just, you know, get a bunch of antimatter and then we can go to the nearest star system. Uh, that's a great idea. In fact, this is a picture from a NASA study uh, done about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, by something called the uh, NASA uh, Innovative and Advanced Concepts Program. Uh, and I got all excited about it because there were friends of mine that did this and we all looked very good. Uh, except we took this study to famous physicists like Ed Witten at Princeton and he looked at it and smiled and said, he said, they made about an eight order of magnitude error in this. And we looked at it for us, so they did. <laughs> And uh, the, uh, uh, it turns out that, that we're about 16 orders of magnitude off in how we make antimatter today. So this one is another one we kind of put in the future. Uh, but there is a technology uh, that does work, and this is a very old technology that you, you either harness energy you already find or you keep the energy source behind. It's sailing. Uh, as, I, as I said, this is a very old idea. Uh, Kepler actually wrote a letter to Galileo in 1610 saying, why don't we sail in space using the winds of space? Now, we're not sure exactly what he thought about, but uh, we think, we, we know what we could do, and that's light sailing. Uh, the uh, light sailing is where you use light pressure on a very low mass sail to, uh, uh, to accelerate it. Uh, this has been done, this is, this is a, a let me go back here. This is a, a, an experiment done by the Planetary Society. Uh, the Japanese Space Agency has also done one. Uh, the trouble is that it uses sunlight, but sunlight's not strong enough to, to get us to these, uh, the high speeds we need. So we looked at the idea as if, can we build a really, really small spacecraft and build, uh, rather than using uh, sunlight, that we can use a much more intense source of light, which would be a laser beam, uh, and this looks like it would work. Uh, 
but this, the laser we need is like really huge. This is an atrocious artist conception of it. Uh, the, uh, in fact, any of your artists, we'd like a much better picture. Uh, but this is a really big laser. It's a 100 gigawatt laser. Uh, it's a kilometer or more across. Uh, but for reasons I'm going to talk about, we think we can eventually build these in the next few decades. Uh, and, and by the way, if you want to go to Alpha Centauri, this needs to be in the southern hemisphere. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a couple places it could be put. Uh, uh, our best idea was in Chile. Uh, unfortunately, when we made our announcement, I forgot to tell the Chilean government. And uh, I've since been summoned to talk to the president of Chile, uh, both of them, by the way, the previous one and the current one. They actually like the idea, they just want us to be more open. Uh, Australia is a potential place, the southern part of Australia, New Zealand, and maybe South Africa. So, uh, uh, you know, all possible. Uh, the, uh, uh, there, there's two developments that start making this really feasible, and, and I'll talk about microelectronics, but, you know, we use lasers for communications and uh, for fibers and, and now even open space communications. And so there's been a, there's probably literally trillions of dollars have been mentioned, have been invested in photonics. Uh, indeed, when we looked at this, we find that, that the ability to build a powerful laser, the cost per watt is on a Moore's law. Every few years, you're getting a 50% uh, reduction. Uh, it's a log linear plot, and, and this trend, by the way, has continued. Uh, and uh, the power and the cost of, uh, you know, of, of very powerful lasers is, is also going in the right direction. Uh, these calculations showed us to build a 100 gigawatt laser in about 15 or 20 years, that cost about what the James Webb Space Telescope is, seems to be feasible. Uh, indeed, we've, uh, we've uh, started doing some research on this. We've uh, got a dozen contracts we just signed. One of those are with the Australian National University. Uh, so we'll be visiting them uh, uh, here next week to get, kick off that program. Uh, the second thing is spacecraft. Uh, this is a typical communications spacecraft. It weighs a few, uh, few thousand kilograms. Uh, you know, in, in the last few decades, we've gotten spacecraft down to a kilogram, but we need to go another three orders of magnitude. Uh, and uh, the, uh, we need to build something that's kind of like the chip in your watch. Uh, and this actually is quite feasible, so I mean, I brought my spacecraft with me, so I challenge anybody else to, to do the same. Uh, these, uh, this technology is, is here today. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is a, a, one of the spacecraft we, we launched. Uh, let me get up here. This is a chipsat. Uh, it was launched uh, about a year ago uh, on a... Uh, It was launched on the Venta satellite, which was Latvia's first satellite. Once again, we forgot to tell the Latvian government we put this on a, their satellite. Uh, the, the, this was done through many beers and wines. Uh, but uh, this worked. This is, this is a very simple satellite. It's what's called a BeepSat. Uh, this was actually built by students at, uh, at Cornell University. Uh, what we uh, uh, figured out, though, we still need to go a little smaller, so we need to build a uh, even smaller satellite. Uh, this is the, what we call a star chip. This is a prototype uh, also put together by Cornell University. We're gonna start launching these in the next, uh, next year or two. So this is a, a new revolution in spacecraft that this actually could do everything we need to do. Uh, it has power systems, communications, orientation, and uh, the ability to operate for decades in space. So we would attach this to a to a light sail, uh, about a four or five meter light sail, uh, like this, and then hit it with a laser for 10 minutes. You accelerate it at a few tens of thousands of Gs, uh, and then it's on its way to Alpha Centauri. Uh, by the way, this uh, on the space station right now is the next experiment. There's about 120 of these, these current chip sats that are about to be deployed uh, off a of CubeSat. So like I said, this technology is real. Uh, so our objective is to do some research 
uh, over the next five to seven years, and, and Yuri Milner has committed 100 million U.S. dollars. Uh, there's three things we're focusing on. Uh, the first one is the cost, getting the cost of the laser system down. The second one is building these kind of things and attaching them to a light sail. And the third one, which is the hardest, I think, of all, is how to communicate back from Alpha Centauri. Uh, on this chip is a small, you know, multi-watt pulse laser. Uh, after we flew by a target planet, we would do just what the, 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 uh, the Pluto mission did. We'll turn around, uh, aim back on the Earth with the laser on this, and then send images back. Uh, we calculated in theory we can get, you know, maybe a few hundred bits per second, uh, but we've got to be able to prove that. So the, the challenge is that if this all works over the next uh, uh, five to seven years, that we would then build a prototype, uh, probably a billion dollar class prototype, uh, and then if that works about 20 years from now, we'd start building the full scale uh, system, which we hope would cost about $10 billion and would end up being a, a partnership between uh, uh, space agencies and, and private individuals like ourselves. Uh, and, I, and I won't go through that. Now, the third question is, is there any place to go? Uh, I mean, if we're going to spend tens of billions of dollars to go to the nearest star system, is there anything there? Uh, just to remind you, the nearest star system is actually uh, has three stars in it. Two of them are about the size of the sun, one's a little bigger, one's a little smaller, uh, Alpha Centauri A and B. Uh, but there's a third star in the system, which is one of these red dwarf stars uh, called Proxima Centauri. Uh, it's actually fairly far away from the other two, and it was just the last decade that people actually proved that really was orbiting the other two stars. Uh, the, uh, when we made our announcement, uh, in 2016, we didn't know of any planets in this system, but just to show sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, uh, two months after we made our announcement, the uh, European Southern Observatory announced in Munich that there was a planet discovered orbiting Proxima Centauri, an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. Uh, they uh, uh, made an announcement. They were nice enough to invite me. Uh, they had an ulterior motive because uh, oh, by the way, this is the picture they released, so I guess we don't need to go there. Uh, <laughs> kind of looks like parts of the southwest U.S. or Australia. So. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the question is, is, we'd really like to have a lot more data about both this, and we'd really like to find a planet orbiting uh, Alpha Centauri A or B, a more Earth-like place. Uh, so we... Uh, we funded, along with the European Southern Observatory, a, uh, an instrument that's uh, really the first of its kind that uh, can directly image uh, a planet at 10 microns in the thermal infrared. Uh, the instrument was shipped a couple weeks ago. We'll be on the telescope in, in March for a couple months uh, of observation. So if we're lucky, we will find an Earth-sized planet orbiting in the habitable zone. Uh, this is, like I said, the extremely large telescope on Chile. Chile, but we won't be able to tell whether it's, it's a life-bearing planet. Uh, the next step is to use the next generation of telescopes. This is the European Extremely Large Telescope. There are a couple other projects. Now, I have to say, as an astronomer, I'm kind of embarrassed at the titles of these. It's Very Large Telescope, Extremely Large Telescope. Uh, initially, and this is no kidding, th this telescope was called the Overwhelmingly Large Telescope. <laughs> Uh, but they had a budget cut, so it's now just the extremely large telescope. So uh, it's, uh, we ought to do better than that. Uh, I think the other telescopes, one of them is called the 30-meter uh, telescope. That's a very creative title. And the third one is a little better. It's called the Giant Magellan Telescope. But there's three of these uh, being built. But these will be able not only to image these planets around in the Alpha Centauri system, but get a spectrum of its atmosphere that we'll be able to see if it's life-bearing. Uh, uh, now, there's another program, uh, and I won't go into detail on this, but to say the reason I put this up here, this is a, an idea that a, uh, an astronomer at the University of Sydney uh, came up with, that we can measure the mass of any planets we find by looking at wobbles of the star called astrometric wobbling, 
that, uh, that you can directly deduce the mass of the planet. Uh, so he came up with this concept. Uh, uh, we think we can launch one of these small satellites to watch the position of Alpha Centauri A and B relative to each other. We can get enough accuracy that we might be able to see a planet as small as Mars orbiting them and get its mass. Uh, we're also working on a bigger version of that with the Italian Space Agency. Uh, so this, this is kind of another cool project. Uh, I might say that you know we're beginning to find that there's planets everywhere. This is the second nearest star, the Barnard star. It now has been shown to have a planet probably not in the habitable zone. So there's other targets. Uh, the, uh, this is what the artists say that planet looks like. Kind of looks like the other one. Uh, the, uh, uh, there are future possibilities and there are some things that we're looking at. The question is, is there life in our solar system is something that space agencies have been looking at, but frankly not very quickly. Uh, most of the effort is focused on this object. Uh, I am fairly confident we're going to find life there, probably underneath the surface. There is uh, evidence of, of water processes under the surface. Uh, but I'm really more interested in, in these. This is Enceladus. Uh, this is mission from the Cassini mission. There's geysers of water spurting out of, this is an ocean world. It's a, there's a, a moon-wide ocean and ice over the surface. The ice cracks and water squirts into space. Uh, Cassini detected there's organic molecules in this water. It kind of looks like seawater. Uh, so we have a program to see privately, can we send a probe here and do it cheaply that can fly through those geysers of water and determine is this complicated chemistry, uh, organic, real organic chemistry, maybe even DNA and RNA. Uh, uh, another place that we might find is this, this is Venus. Uh, you know, we found out a few decades ago that the, that the surface of Venus is literally hellish. It's, you know, uh, 500 degrees centigrade or so. Uh, but there's a layer in the clouds about 50 kilometers above the surface that uh, is about the same temperature and pressure as it is in this room. Uh, it's right in the middle of the clouds, which happen to be sulfuric acid clouds, uh, except that on, on Earth, that there's a lot of life that lives in a sulfuric acid, uh, extremophiles, it's called. Uh, there are ideas that we could float a balloon uh, and look for life there. Uh, there's also a mysterious ultraviolet absorption feature that that uh, could be indicative of a photosynthetic pigment. Uh, this guy is, uh, is, is our newest employee at the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. This is John Grunsfeld. He was the astronaut that rescued Hubble. Uh, he is running a study to see if we can do a, a mission uh, more likely to this object. This is Europa, the, uh, one of the big moons of Jupiter, which also is an ocean world that has ice that cracks and water is spraying into space. So, so we're looking at a, a public-private partnership here. We've just signed agreements with NASA to work on these missions. Uh, one of the discussions we're going to have here is other other is is other space agencies like Australian space agents that are interested in this. So, there, there may be future missions in that. Uh, the last thing before I uh, open for questions is uh, we have an annual conference. Uh, uh, it's held at the anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's historic flight. Uh, and this year we're going to talk about a, a very interesting concept. Uh, you know, I, I, I went over to the, to the, uh, uh, the museum down, right down the street here. How, how many of you have been there? The, the museum is really cool. Uh, and and it, on the third floor there was a, a display of some of the earliest evidence of life on Earth, which came from Australia. Uh, and the best we can tell, life emerged on Earth about four billion years ago. Uh, the, uh, uh, the geneticists that, that we've been working with uh, tell us that, that that earliest life form on Earth that we can trace all current life back to uh, was uh, is something called LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. But it's a very sophisticated life form. We have a pretty good idea what its genes were. Had about 500 genes, about 300, 350. We know what they did. The other 100, 200, we haven't the slightest idea. Uh, but uh, there's an argument in the in the in the the genetics and 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 biochemical community that could this have emerged on Earth uh, 
and a few hundred million years after the planet cooled? And uh, my view is no. Uh, others view yes. But uh, one of the possibilities is life didn't start on Earth. It came from elsewhere. This is called panspermia. So our topic this year is panspermia. And, and the reason I put this up is there, this is a very interesting question because if life came from elsewhere, where? And when did it really start? Uh, you know, can we find evidence at nearby star systems? Uh, is other life in our solar system? We find it from the from this same external source. But one of the more interesting questions, and, and this was a question posed in 1973 by by uh, Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA, who said, "Well, what if it was planted here by some intelligent entity? Uh, that's called directed panspermia." So we've, we've had a couple workshops on this, which were huge arguments. <laughs> it's a very interesting question. The third thing, though, is that if you look at these star chips that we're talking about building, uh, within the next century, or the, later this century, we'll have the ability to do our own panspermia. And the question, is that a good idea? How would we do it? Uh, there's ethics issues uh, and so forth. So this is our, the topic of our, of our discussion this year, and so we're quite excited about it. Uh, every year we invite the heads of science and the heads of space agencies around the world. We're working closely, so uh, we, we, we met with, uh, with uh, Megan here, uh, uh, Megan Clark, and, and we've invited her, so we, we hopefully will in, in involve a lot, of, uh, a lot of these new emerging really exciting space agencies. Well, let me stop there. If all goes well, uh, sometime here in about 50 years we may get our first image of a surface of another star. If we're really lucky, we'll see sort of evidence of an alien civilization, uh, hopefully not sending starships our way. Uh, but uh, uh, at any rate, it's really cool stuff. I'm delighted to be here again with ISU and happy to answer your questions. Thank you. OK, we have time for some questions. We have a couple of staff on each side. Um, if you have a question, just please uh, lift your arm, and we'll have somebody come to you with a microphone. Thanks for the uh, lecture, Pete. Uh, if you do uh, return some evidence of extraterrestrial life, Will you share that with the public straight away? Would you tell a select group of people? That's, I mean, that's information that would change the course of history. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I can't keep a secret. That's why I'm not an Air Force <laughs> General anymore. Yeah. Uh, and none of the rest of the people working with us. But it's actually our, our foundation policy to publish everything. Uh, the, uh, uh, of course, when we told the US government that, it said, what about export control stuff? So, well, everything but export control. Alien intelligence is not export control yet, uh, but uh, I, the, uh, I think that, that, that I mean, I, the, probably before we officially released it, we would, we'd want to have some validation. Uh, so if, if we have a mission that we send to Venus and we find life there, you know, there would be a, a few intense weeks of the science team, you know, is this real evidence? Most data is pretty, you know, is right at the edge of, mathematical you know, believability. Uh, if we found an intelligence signal, it's likely to be very sketchy. Uh, and uh, so it would be a, but it's almost assuredly going to be you know, published and discussed. And, and in fact, I, I give you an example here of the last, this is not too long ago. Uh, about a year and a half ago, there was the, the first interstellar asteroid was discovered, Oumuamua. And uh, all that data was published, and uh, interestingly enough, the chairman of our Starshot Committee, Avi Loeb at Harvard, uh, was re-looking at the data, and he said, well, you know, this actually looks more like a light sail than it does a, a rock. And uh, I'm not sure I believe him, uh, but he published that right away. And uh, the, uh, it, it's caused quite a lot of consternation uh, in, in the scientific community, but, uh, but I, I think that, that this very likely would get released as soon as we had some believability that it, there's, there's anything there. Yeah. Hello. Um, you mentioned and showed a picture of an astronaut 
who went up and fixed Hubble. Yes. Did he fix it or was it being used for something before he fixed it? Uh, no, that <laughs> the, the, uh, now I, I will tell you that, you know, I, I am a retired Air Force General, that the design for that telescope, that wasn't the first use of it. <laughs> uh, telescopes of, uh, of that design were used for Earth observations for military purposes before that, and, and NASA modified that design for a, a space telescope. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, it turned out that, you know, uh, I mean, I'm a former NASA official, but I got in a lot of trouble because I used to make statements like NASA stands for never a straight answer. And, and uh, the, uh, uh, I wrote an article in the 70s that I referred to NASA as a self-licking ice cream cone. You, you look it up online. So I, you know, I'm always very skeptical. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, Hubble was mismanaged very badly and uh, the testing, because they had budget cuts, they didn't test it completely and it was figured perfectly but perfectly wrong. So uh, the, uh, and they had end up spending another billion dollars to fix it. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I mean, it, uh, the, you know, there's always a view that, well, this was, you know, some sort of secret conspiracy, but, you know, I worked for the U.S. government far too long to, to, to believe that secret conspiracies ever worked. Uh, I worked in the White House twice, so I, uh, the, they're just the same goofy people like me and make mistakes. So it's uh, the, the, what you see is what you get. I, I, you know, and, I, and I know John Grunsford very well, and he's, you know, was involved in, in all of the design work to fix it and uh, uh, did quite a good job at it. And then he, you know, I think three more times went up and repaired the, repaired the, the telescope. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it really showed, I, I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of argument in the scientific community. Do you need manned space, uh, human space? Uh, activities or not, and and I think the fact that Hubble could be fixed with a somebody going up and actually literally taking a wrench and and, and, and unbolding something and putting something in it, it's really a great accomplishment. So uh, I think there's a long, interesting future for human activity in space. So, yeah, I have a question in about the panspermia. In ISRO, we have conducted the experiment and we found three new microorganisms. Even we have given names also. But uh, how do you confirm that they don't belong to ISRO? Oh, sorry, they don't belong to uh, Earth because we are observing from Earth, right? Well, I mean, th this is a really, uh, the panspermia, this is the question is about panspermia, is how do you know it came from Earth or not? Uh, we don't, but uh, the, there's a lot of different sciences involved in this. The, uh, that we're pretty sure that that the the, the this Luca, this origin of, of all life, that we know it today, is a uh, you know that, that it existed probably about four billion years ago. The problem is is that we find no evidence of anything prior to that, and the biochemists tell us that prior to a DNA universe, you had to have an RNA universe uh, using the, uh, the RNA molecule. And uh, people have looked, but they haven't seen any evidence of that. Uh, so that's, now there's biochemists that are trying to look for that. So that's a thing we can do on the Earth. Uh, we also, if you, if, if you think there was a very, a lot of activity on the Earth prior to that, there's the idea that maybe there's a second genesis someplace that we might find, might find evidence for a different life form that didn't originate with Luca. Uh, that's been looked for, but, but not terribly well. So there's a lot of work on Earth to really, do you need to have life come from somewhere else? But maybe the most important thing is if we find life on Mars and we look at its, in, 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 assuming it's DNA and RNA based, uh, well, if it's not, then that proves that, that life probably originated here, at least our life, uh, and then other life originated elsewhere. But if it turns out that the genome for that has this originated in the same place, that it has the same coding, that says one or two things. One is that life might have gone between the planets, or it could have been, a, it all came from somewhere else. But even more importantly, if we find life 
uh, on Europa or Enceladus or Venus, then that gives us another sample. So if we find life everywhere in the solar system and it all has the same genetic code, then that be tends to tell us that it all had the same origin and that origin could have been somewhere else. So it's a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, it's a topic that is fraught with controversy. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, uh, there was a very famous British astronomer and his student, uh, Fred Hoyle and, and Chandra Wickramasinghe from uh, Sri Lanka, that wrote a paper that said that all life came from space and they postulated that viruses came from space and so forth. Uh, it, and that was sort of considered goofy. Uh, although there have been experiments that have found what could be life in space, but it's very, very hard to prove that you didn't take it with you. Uh, so this is, a, this is a really interesting question, and I, uh, uh, this is the whole question of astrobiology, which I find the most fascinating you know, topic in, in space science today. Uh, yeah, you um, said about going to uh, Europa and Enceladus. What are the plans to get uh, probes there and collect samples and data and look for evidence of life there with, um, with your program and with you guys? Yes, yeah, so I wasn't. I didn't quite get the question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, what's the plan to go to Enceladus and Europa through? Well, yeah. What we're what we're looking at is uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, we established some advisory committees of some of the key astrobiologists, and we looked at, uh, okay, where would you go in the solar system to look for life? And uh, the conclusion was that there were sort of four areas, uh, well, five. I mean, one of them was under the surface on Mars. Uh, the NASA and other space agencies are doing that. Uh, the second one, and that where there was a lot of excitement was Enceladus because of the Cassini data. Uh, the third one is, is Europa, obviously. Uh, the fourth one is Titan, uh, which may have exotic life. And the fifth one is, uh, Venus. And of course, we were looking at what can a private foundation do that, you know, we're, we're not going to fund, you know, $2 billion projects, but we might fund several hundred million dollar projects. So we looked at what could we do with a pretty simple spacecraft. And our conclusion was that, that uh, flying through the plumes of water of either Europa or Enceladus could be done quite cheaply or dropping a very simple probe into the Venusian atmosphere. So we are in the process of doing uh, pre-phase A and phase A studies. Uh, we've signed an agreement with NASA to work with NASA. We're looking at other partnerships around the world. Uh, as I mentioned, we're working with, on a different project with the Italian Space Agency. So we hope that, uh, you know, we hope that, uh, that in the next four or five months, our principal sponsor, Yuri Milner, will, will make a decision on one, of the, one or more of these missions. Uh, but so I, I just sort of stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question there. Uh, presuming that one of these uh, probes in the not too distant future picks up that there is a form of life on one of these possibilities like Enceladus or Triton, what, I mean, one of the major agencies is going to want to go and get some of it. Yes. What protocols would you put in place to ensure that it doesn't escape onto Earth and create a, uh, a major problem? Well, the, 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 the idea of planetary protection is a really big one. Most of the effort by space agencies is that we don't contaminate it. Uh, although when I talk to politicians, I, it's, it sort of turns out that, uh, that there's a unified view that this is dangerous. The, the people on the left are worried about us contaminating it people on the right are worried about it contaminating us. Uh, so there's a bipartisan concern. Uh, the, uh, I think the answer to this is if we found evidence of life, whether it's on Mars or Enceladus or Venus or wherever, uh, although there would certainly be people who'd say, let's bring it back here, uh, that's probably a bad idea. Uh, so I think what we would probably do is we're very close to having automated laboratories that can do gene sequencing and so forth. So say we went to Enceladus and found that, uh, that there's a, uh, what looks like DNA there. 
the next probe would probably have a DNA analyzer, which they're now getting to be, you know, kind of something you, you know, kilogram scale, that uh, you could sequence it and, and send back the information and say, okay, this is what its, 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 its genetic code is. Or if we find it's based on some exotic chemistry, then we can, you know, we could do a robotic analyzer that says, okay, here's, here's its code. Maybe it uses different amino acids or even different bases. Uh, although there's a big argument in the biochemist community whether you can do things without DNA and RNA. Uh, I, I will say that one of our advisors is, uh, is a, uh, a biochemistry professor at the uh, University of Glasgow, uh, Lee Cronin, and he's trying to create alien life in his laboratory. So that may be more dangerous than, <laughs> than bringing it back. So uh, uh, Lee's kind of a mad scientist type, but a very smart one. But, uh, but uh, I think there's certainly, there's certainly, for those of you involved in the policy and law issue, it's, uh, there's a lot of work to be done that is how do we handle when we find life how do we make sure we don't contaminate it and it doesn't contaminate us? So, now if it turns out the, the, G, the DNA code is the same origin, then that means that we were all contaminated by something that's panspermia. Uh, the question is, was it done by some intelligence or not? So, uh, and that, that begins to get us into religious questions, which I'm not gonna go into. Well, thank you for an excellent talk. When I look at something like a, a stromatolite or thrombolite, um, I don't immediately recognise that as life. Yeah. Uh, how confident are you that when we go to these worlds, we will recognise something as life? That's a good question. Me, I'm not very confident. Uh, the biochemists are very confident. Uh, and I'm not a biochemist. I mean, I'm an optical astronomer. Uh, the, uh, I think that's one of the most interesting things is that and, and this is really when you start to look at the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, how do you know that you're looking for the right thing? Uh, by the way, how many of you saw the movie Arrival a year and a half ago? Uh, I thought that was one of the best movies to, to think about this because you found aliens that don't communicate the same way. In fact, they don't even understand physics the same way. Uh, now, I mean, it's obviously a writer that did that, but uh, we just don't know what we don't know. And... Uh, one of the criticisms that a lot of people have of the current SETI efforts is we're looking for radio signals that look like what we would send. And uh, this sort of reminds me of the old joke about the, 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 the guy that was looking for his car keys that he lost underneath the street light, you know, and somebody asked him, did he think he lost them there? He said, no, but that's the only place I can see. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not a bad starting point, but uh, I think we really, need a lot more creative uh, look at this. Uh, we've had some, some interesting discussions with the various countries' intelligence communities uh, because they try to look for intelligence signals in what looks like noise and garbage uh, that, uh, I mean, obviously they, they, they believe that humans created that. Uh, but uh, they have a lot of techniques that are really creative in terms of is there information content, you know, is there entropy above, you know, what you expect. Uh, so it's a... Uh, uh, I'm pretty skeptical. I think the, 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 if we start seeing funny phenomenon, you know, that, that uh, that's why, you know, the question about would we report it, the, the idea is most likely you'd see something that uh, there's may or may not be something there. So it's best to publish it and then somebody else can look at it. I think we have uh, one more time, one question only. Bronwyn? Hi, uh, thanks very much, Pete. I was wondering if there are any plans to further investigate the Trappist system and how much further away that is than Alpha Centauri. Uh, yeah, I mean, the Trappist system is interesting because it's, it's the nearest uh, red dwarf star that has transits. Now, there, uh, there's others that, that we're gonna look for. That's what the test mission that was just launched uh, year, over a year ago is trying to do. Uh, Trappist uh, one is about 33 light years away. Uh, you know, Alpha Centauri is 10 times closer almost. Uh, we are very interested in, in, you know, we hope the nearest star system, Alpha Centauri, is really interesting. Uh, of course, there was a recent Chinese science fiction series about the three-body problem that made it too interesting. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, 
the, uh, if we don't find anything there, we'd go on to the next nearest star system. Probably the technology we're talking about limits us practically to, you know, three parsecs or so, so, you know, 10, 11 light years. Uh, and there's about 50 stars, I think, within that limit. There's about four or five that are kind of solar type. Uh, and there's a, the rest of them are red dwarf stars. And then there's a couple bigger stars, or Sirius and a few white dwarfs and, and so forth. But the, uh, we're hoping that's a big enough sample that with these new instruments that uh, we'll get a pretty good sample. Uh, Trappist is probably a little far from any technology that we're going to have to wait for the fusion rockets or the antimatter or something for those. Uh, the, the method that we're looking at, maybe you could push the speed to 30 or 40 percent light speed. Uh, that, you know, that starts to say you might be able in a, you know, we're humans and we live, you know, a good bit of a century. So you don't want to have a mission that takes much longer than a person's career. So 30, 40 years is about the maximum. Uh, maybe if we extend our life to a few centuries, then we start looking at longer missions. The, uh, that's biomedical stuff, really cool too. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Morgan. Okay, so this concludes all the formalities for today. I would like to invite all of you guys to, to join us at the Yungandi building, and uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you very much.